What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. Welcome back to Ten Year Town. We are getting ready to make the new Q and A episode. So, if you have any questions, things you want to know, questions you want to ask me, submit those at tenyeartown.com. Also, we are putting together a meetup towards the end of the year. So, if you want all the details for that, uh, join the Ten Year Town community. Also at tenyeartown.com. Thanks. Today's guest is the legendary Derek Wells. Derek Wells is a session guitar player that has played on over 100 number one songs. He is also a fantastic producer. He's helped produce some of your favorite acts like Hardy, Maddie and Tay, Scotty McCreary. He is also a publisher over at Spirit Music Group. He kind of does it all. Please welcome Derek Wells. How are you? I'm great. Yeah? How are you, man? I'm good. Do you have a good day today? I've had a good, it's been a, it's been a good Monday. It's a strange Monday. Yeah. Did it's you, nine, it's nine 11. Yeah. It's a weird Monday. Yeah. Charlie Robeson just died. That, yeah. That really messed me up yesterday. Uh, all the Morocco. It's a weird Monday, yeah. but, but on me personally, I've had a fine day. Yes. Okay. What does a normal Monday look like for you in the office? You doing a session? Like what's the, <sighs> what is an, any normal day look like for me? <laughs> um, uh, I had an office day. I was at the publishing house. I was at Spirit today, um, just trying to get catch up because I had a pretty uh, gnarly week of sessions last week. Gotcha. And didn't didn't have as much time in the building and with the team as I would have liked. So I did a lot of catching up today. Nice. Because I've got <laughs> kind of another gnarly week this week. So. Okay. I'm curious about all that, but maybe we'll get there yeah. later on. But um, I always start this thing off with the same question, which is just how, how long have you been in town? I've been here my whole life. Grew, born and raised? I was born in Nashville, Arkansas. Okay. Can't make that up. And uh, when I was about 10 months old, my parents moved here. Wow. And uh, I've lived, yeah, I've lived here since I was about that, about 10 months old, not okay. quite a year old. Were they in the, in the business or? Yeah, they were. So they had a, they owned a little theater okay. in Nashville, Arkansas, not a movie theater, like a theater with a stage that gotcha. just held like a couple hundred people, very small. Yeah. And uh, it was called the Alberta Theater that they had bought and kind of fixed up. And my dad's a guitar player and, and, a, and a singer and my mom's a singer and a piano player. And they kind of recruited their friends and their job was that they hosted a like top 40 country night okay. on Friday and Saturday nights at the Alberta Theater. And people from Arkansas, Nashville, Arkansas and the surrounding areas would come to the show and just hear like my mom and dad and some of their friends in the band play songs on the radio. Yeah. Right then, right? Yeah. You know, they didn't have concerts and everything. That was their version of it. And the, the show was called Nashville Swangin'. Not swingin'. Swangin'. So they were swangin'. Uh, and uh, my mom's water broke on stage playing piano, <laughs> doing a Linda Ronstadt song one night. And then, and I was born. And then um, I think it was my dad's dad that kind of really encouraged him like, hey, if you're going to be for real about this, you got to come to, yeah. you got to move to Nashville. Yeah. And so they, they moved to Nashville. Wow. Yeah. How did you, I guess you always played family of musicians. So. I got a really late start though. I, um, I think for a lot of people, I think whatever intrinsically, you just think what your parents do isn't cool. Yeah. The majority of my parents' careers, especially when I was young, was they were touring musicians. They were side, you know, side men. My dad played guitar and my mom played, played piano and sang and, they toured a lot and were gone a lot. And okay. I, I didn't love that as a kid. I was, I kind of had a bad taste in my mouth over all that. Yeah. So no, I, I didn't want to have anything to do with music. Didn't, didn't care for it. <laughs> the other thing I tell people is, you know, a common story I hear in Nashville from people that have moved here is, is like, well, my parents weren't musical, but you know, my dad listened to these great records and we always had like the Beatles play in or we listened to Waylon Jennings or that kind of stuff. It's like, dude, my parents were listening to <laughs> shitty music. They had to learn to go play somebody's <laughs> showcase, right? <laughs> like music was very much a job in our house. Yeah. 
and they did not really listen recreationally. Okay. So it was like if music was playing in our house or in the car or anything, it was like something they had to learn. Gotcha. My mom would be like working on harmonies in the car for something. And the whole thing was just not cool to me. It was right. It's like, no, no, no. It was no, a no. job. Very much a job. And then, yeah, when I was like a, in my teens, I was like 16 and my cousin played drums and he kind of was like, come jam with me at my house and just get one of your dad's guitars and that kind of started it. Yeah. And then when it really sank was I went to college um, when I was 17. I went to college uh, in Bowling Green at Western Kentucky for like a little more than a year. Yeah. Um, and something happened in that era. It was, you know, Napster was happening. LimeWire was happening um, which, you know, now you realize in hindsight how bad that was for the industry. But at the time I didn't, you know, the yeah. kids were like, you can get all this music on here and there's music videos. Uh, and it was like, oh, wait a minute. I can watch this video of Dave Matthews and like see how his hands yeah, and kind of like see how he's playing it or, you know, pull up this video of 311 and like watch how the guy's playing guitar. Yeah. Whoa, wait a minute. And that kind of year is when the hooks got in me. That's, that got you, that was that's like, how I, you caught I, the bug. I remember coming home from college one weekend and being like, dad, do you have a guitar I could just take? Mm. And I had a, an old Sony laptop and I went to Radio Shack and had a, like just rigged this series of adapters together with an old Line 6 pod and had just somehow like caveman figured yeah. out how to play my guitar into the laptop yeah. and hear it in my headphones with, so I could play in my dorm and, and that's where it started. And then, yeah, after a little bit of time that I, I told my parents, you know, I came home and it was just like, Hey, I think I'm gonna, mm. I think I'm going to try this. How did they react to that? Hey, hey, they were terrified. <laughs> they, they were like, this is a terrible idea. Uh, you're getting too late of a start. Um, oh, wow. all the, all the things, um, they they were really horrified yeah. to hear the news. And and I realize in hindsight, I think their biggest concern was, you know, that maybe the narrative was, well, you know, Derek's kind of floundering in in school and he's a little lost and and he's doing this because he thinks this will be easy. Mm. And uh, it was actually the opposite. Like I, because of them, I feel like I had a very real understanding of where the bar was and how good you had to be. Yeah. And I knew that I was not that good. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, my version of taking a run at it was not that I went out and immediately started trying to go play guitar for people. It was that I spent a year waiting tables and practicing. Yeah. Like I was, I had moved back into my dad's basement and I was down there and I had one guitar mm -hmm. and I would go wait tables and I used every dime I made to like, slowly buy equipment and I would go to Walmart and I would buy CDs and I would learn them and I taught myself how to write charts and all wow. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, because I knew, I was like, I, I'm not good enough to go play. Yeah. I see, I'm, I'm not as good as my dad. Yeah. He's awesome. And so like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go out there and embarrass myself, you yeah. know, embarrass them. <laughs> um, and then, you know, after enough time, a couple opportunities arose and it started to make sense. Yeah. Did they, uh, eventually, did they realize you were serious about it? Yeah. I think they, you know, I think six or seven months in, you know, particularly my dad, cause he had a front row seat with me living in the basement. Like he was kind of seeing the hours. He was like, man, he's in there all the time. Yeah. He loves it. And I think he started to kind of go, well, he's got a long way to go, but he's, yeah, he hasn't gotten tired of it yet. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it's interesting. Like my family was not um, a family of musicians. Right. So it's was just kind of blindly figuring all this yeah, out. No. And uh, the reason I went to Berkeley was because my parents were like, you gotta go to college. And I was like, all right, well, yeah. loophole, I'll go to music college. Yeah. <laughs> Took me till after my junior year of college to realize like, oh, I'm not good enough. Like I, yeah. I'm good enough, I have a natural ability. Yep. That's uh, why I'm here how I got here because I could sing, but I, I had auditioned um, in between my sophomore and junior year for like a wedding band. Okay. And I had to learn like five songs. Yeah. And it was just like, a, I was horrible. 
Yeah. You know, I flopped. Most of us are. And it embarrassed me. Yes. And then I worked um, for a mechanical royalties company that summer. That was my internship in New York. Okay. And I was like, I do not want to do this. Yeah. I do not. I thought I wanted to be in the music business. Yeah. You know, on the whatever, the, yeah. the business, business side. side yeah. And realized that, no, I wanted... I wanted to do music. Yeah. I wanted to be a musician. And in order to do that, I was going to have to grind and get a lot better very quickly so that my senior year of college, I was just, I, I had another audition for a different wedding band and I just grinded yeah. for, for month, for like a whole month up to that audition. And then I got the gig and I had to learn, I think like 150 songs yeah. and 50 of those I was singing on. So I had to play guitar and sing. And it was, that was my education was like, I right. got to do this or I will embarrass myself. <laughs> That's it. I mean, it's like you, 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 it's the, you get pushed out of the nest or, you know, however you want to, yeah. however you want to frame it. And, th and that's the other part is, you know, I feel like I've had this conversation consistently over the years with people is a lot of people are born talented. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are born predisposed to it, you know, more talented than me or you, anybody. So I think that at the end of the day, the kind of luck of the genetic draw is, do you have that thing in your brain that will allow you to do this mm. over and over and over, you know, the 10,000 hours part of it without right. burning out and without getting sick of it? Yeah. And I think that's true for a lot of things. I think that's true for professional athletes. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of, you know, kids are born, you know, with a predisposition or a, or a natural talent towards right. something. And then if you're going to kind of succeed in making it your, you know, your, your life's work, it's really just, is your brain wired in a way that you're not going to hmm. just get sick of this and be like, I'm fuck this, I'm going to do something else. Yeah. Can I, can I take it? Yeah. It's like, yeah, just, is it the, and to your point, like the, the kind of embarrassing parts of it, like not wanting to quit after those instead coming yeah. back and going like, well, I'm going to get good enough that that never happens to me again. Right. Like, yeah. That was I'm, painful. I'm not going to feel like that again. Yeah. So I'm going to figure out how, and there may be another, like I may step in another pothole somewhere else, but I'm not going to step in that one again. Yep. Like hundred percent. And that's, that's life in the music business, but probably in any business yeah, where I think you make a mistake and you improve. I, I think so. Yeah. How did you get from, all right, you're in your basement. Did you get a gig? Yeah. Like what was the, what was the ride like? Yeah. It's, I, it was one thing. So I was waiting tables and, um, a young lady that I was waiting tables with was a singer songwriter, but she didn't really feel like she was a, a competent guitarist to, to accompany herself. Yeah. And she was going to do a writer's round at, I don't even know if this might've been before your time, but Bailey's downtown on yeah, Broadway before my time. used to have a, used to have a rooftop thing and they would do writer's round. One of the many writer's rounds that happens in Nashville. Yeah. And she's like, hey, don't you play guitar? Yeah. And she's like, would you come play this writer's round? Can you learn my songs? And it's like, yeah. And so she, you know, she played them or gave me a CD of them. And uh, I was like, yeah, I can do this. And so I went and played the, the gig with her, just playing acoustic. And the guy running sound at thing is also a guitar player. And he comes up to me after the, after the round and he's like, Hey man, Dave, Hey, nice to meet you. Listen, I'm supposed to go do a gig with this artist, Tammy Cochran in two days in Ohio. I can't do it. And I've called every sub I know. No one can do this gig. Are you available? Do you want to do the gig? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can, I can do it. And he's like, okay, great here's my address, come to my house tomorrow. I'll give you everything, you know? It was, it was like early aughts. Like you didn't just email songs and stuff. Right. Like, yeah. You had to get them. So I drove to his house over on Edge Hill. He actually lived on Villa Street. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. That's back, that's a long time ago, but that's where he lived. And he gave me two burned CDs. One was a live set and one was like the album. Yeah. And was like, bus call is 7 a.m. on you know, whatever Thursday morning you go, okay, cool. Yeah. So I go home, I write the charts, I learn the songs. I tell my parents and they're like, wow, well, do you, and you don't know anybody else in the band? I'm like, no, the God just asked me. <laughs> so. Did you even know like what the, 
what the pay was, what the situation was? I, I think he might have said, like, I think yeah. he might have been like, it pays whatever, two hundred dollars. Yeah, and, you know, it's, I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And I was, I wasn't it's new. I wasn't new to tour buses or like bus etiquette because I had kind of grown up around it. Yeah, I show up at the guitar center at like six thirty in the morning and I start loading my stuff. Well, poke my head up on the bus and I go, hey, is this Tammy Cochran's bus? A couple guys are like, yeah, yeah. So I put my gear in, load up all my stuff, go sit, sitting in the lounge. And a couple people start showing up and, and, and finally one of the guys goes, so man, who are you? <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm Derek. And they're like, yeah, no, man, nice to meet you. But like, what are you, what are you doing here? Yeah. I'm like, oh, well, I'm playing guitar, Dave. What? And this dude had not told them he wasn't coming. Oh, wow. And uh, they got like pretty panicky yeah. really, really quickly. I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty positive that in that moment, they were all outside trying to call other guitar players to get somebody to, yeah. you know, I was 18 years old. Right. But it, but the bus had, it wasn't a midnight bus call. It was a 7 a.m. bus call because yeah. we were going to the show that day. So they had to I, leave. We had to go. <laughs> and we spent about the first like 45 minutes of them like grilling me pretty hard. Like, mm -hmm. well, do you have the music? What have you, who do you play for? What do you, how did you meet? Who do you know this, you know? Yeah. Whole thing. And it's kind of like, no, look, I've got charts and here's the thing. And yeah. And uh, I don't know if you guys, I don't know, I don't know my parents. And like one of the guys I think knew my mom is like, I know your mom. Okay. All right. <laughs> and I think they started to kind of like, Relax. A little bit, but I think they also just kind of knew like, well, we're stuck with this kid. It yeah. is what it is at this point. We get to the gig and uh, it was a festival. No, you know, no rehearsal. No, just like wire and fire. Yeah. Like walk out there, five minute line check, play the, play the set. It went, you know, it went fine. And uh, on the way back, I think they were just so mad at that, <laughs> that other guy. <laughs> and they, it, they just kind of were like, look, man. Tammy just lost her, lost her record deal. I don't know what next year is going to look like, but she's only got like eight shows the rest of the year. Do you just want to do all the shows? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, heck yeah, I do. I'm like, great. We'll get you. We'll send you the tour dates and yeah, you're hired. And um, was still waiting tables. And then after about my third gig with Tammy, the bass player from her band was like, hey, so I've also been doing this other gig for this girl, Kelly Coffee. She's on Universal and she just lost her deal on the merger too. She's got like 12 shows the rest of the year and none of them overlap with Tammy. So do you, do you want to do? Yeah. And oh, and her guitar just quit being her guitar player to go manage Big and Rich. That was at the time. That was her. Wow. And uh, he's like, so she needs a guitar player. I was like, yeah, 100%. I'll do that. Yeah. And I met a steel guitar player playing for Kelly who left Kelly to go play for this guy, Josh Turner. And then in about three or four months after that, that guy called me and he's like, hey, I'm in Florida right now. Josh Turner's guitar player just quit. He's going to have auditions in a week. Would you want to audition? I think you'd be a good fit. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, of, of course I'll come audition. And I auditioned and I got the Josh gig. And then I was on that gig for five years. Wow. And how old were you when you got the gig? You were like 18, 19? By the time I got Josh's gig, yeah, I was like almost 20 years old. Wow. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was great. And yeah. and and dumb luck, it, again, perspective, like when I got the Josh gig, so he had had Long Black Train for anyone that might be familiar with that. And that yeah. was a, that was a pretty decent hit. It wasn't a number one song, ironically. It was a died at 14. Okay. But it's a career song for him. Yeah. But his next two singles had kind of not done well and he had survived the big label merger, this big universal merger. He had survived that. Yeah. But the writing was definitely on the wall that like, if we don't get something with him in this next batch of tunes, he may not have a record deal either. Yeah. And so I'd been on Josh's gig about four or five months, all on one bus, like just one tour bus. I mean, I was thrilled to be on a tour bus, but yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. the whole band and the crew, you know, 14, Josh and his wife. So 14 people on a 12 wow. bunk. Yeah. Somebody's and using the back, the back lounge, lounge. The back lounge was Josh's. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, between four and six months in, Josh was like, Hey, 
let me play you some of the new music I just got with my producer, Frank. I was like, okay, cool. And I, you know, we sat on the bus and he played me, you were man, would you go with me? And something, he played me like four songs and three of them would go on to be multi-week number ones. Yeah. And they put out your man in like June of that year. And then Josh and I went on this like insane radio tour November, December, and January. And then I just, I have like a vivid memory of at the end of January, the song hit number one, the same day the album came out. And from that moment on, like the next four and a half years I spent with Josh, he was like just on an upward trajectory. It was like hit after hit after hit and the tour kept growing and the things got more comfortable. And, um, and, uh, it was a really great a really, really great place for me to kind of grow up and learn. And yeah. uh, after after about that first eight or so months, he d- decided for whatever reason that I should be the band leader. So I was the the, the band leader for that whole uh, run of things too. And um, learned a lot and met a, a lot of lifelong friends, like people that I still work with to this day yeah. that I met back then, you know, 20 years ago. Right. Did that transition into you playing on sessions? Like how did that kind of... How did that uh, evolve, I guess? I think after about year two of playing with Josh, I kind of thought, okay, I'm I'm safe here. This is good. I'm comfortable now. Like yeah. everybody's good. Everyone's happy. Well, what do I do when we have like time off? Like what am I, what am I supposed to do, you know? And, yeah. And, and then furthermore, kind of too, like, man, what's the next, what is the next move for me, you know? my parents, I think were kind of the ones that were like, well, you know, there's these guys that just play in the studio, but those guys are good. (laughs) And I was like, okay. Like, yeah. Like the guys that play on Josh's records. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those guys don't, you know. Yeah. I was like, okay. All right. And so I just started to find opportunities to, to record guitar, whatever that looked like. Some of it, I wouldn't even call a session. (laughs) Sure. But like, if, you know, anybody that had like some Frankenstein system of home recording, you got to understand that in the mid early 2000s, like home recording was not, people didn't have logic. People didn't have at home DAWs. Home recording was not a thing. It's primitive. Very primitive. Yeah. And if you did have it, it was quite an expense. It was like people had ADATs and- yeah convoluted systems of how to get, I mean, it was, it was not like it was now and direct guitar recording. Yeah. We had pods and they were terrible and everyone knew they were terrible. Yeah. So if you were going to go play electric guitar somewhere, like you had to still mic an amp, like it just, none of the stuff that we have now was, was happening then. Yeah. Um, and because of that, real recording done in studios was really high stakes because it's always expensive to go cut at a studio. Yeah. So, you know, today you might be willing to send someone files and let them put guitar on it. And cause if it's not great, if it doesn't work out, like what are you really out? Yeah. But, but back then you had to wager your whole session on, if will this, this person be able to cut it? And, and because we've got everybody here and we got to do it. And yeah. So I just started slowly, slowly, putting myself out there, you know, I call it going through session ghetto and just any opportunity I could to record my guitar, I could. Yeah. Um, I also started looking to play live more around town. When I wasn't out with Josh, I wanted to be playing. Yeah. And I started to connect with a handful of young singer songwriters. And again, I can trace this all back to one thing, but there was a an artist writer named Megan James that at the time was on uh, Warner Chapel Publishing and she had a developmental deal and they hired a band of kind of young people to do her showcase. Yeah. We did the showcase. Charlie Worsham was in that showcase band with me. Mm. Uh, we did the showcase and she didn't get uh, a record deal and Warner Chapel dropped her and she called me and said, hey, so... I'm changing publishers. I just signed to EMI and I think I'm going to like change my studio band a little bit. And you said that you play on sessions or want to be playing on sessions. And would you like to come do a demo session for me? Yeah. hundred percent. I'm there. 
And I remember it, it was at Station West here in Nashville. And that was the first session I was on where, you know, I looked like I knew who everyone in the room was before, because I'd read lighter, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's Gordon Moat. And that's so, you know, and like these guys have played on like actual hit records. Yeah. I did that session and it went well enough that Megan asked me to do it. She's like, I'm going to do another one in like a month. Yeah. Do you want to come do another demo session? Yeah. And at that demo session, there was another writer that was like, hey, you played on two of my songs on Megan's last session. I loved what you did. Would you do my next session? You know, I use a couple of these same guys and I'd love to have you. Yeah, I'll do that. And then the third Megan session, the bass player was like, hey man, let me get your number. I got a thing coming up you might be good for. And yeah. it l truly just all grew from, from that. Yeah. And then, you know, ultimately there was this moment with Josh where a couple session musicians that I, that were, you know, a few decades ahead of me and that I really trusted and respected had said, Hey man, you could do this. Um, but like, you're, you're probably going to have to quit that gig because mm. if you, if you want to be here, it's like must be present twin. Yeah. If you want to get in this, you're going to have to field a lot of last minute calls and like, you're going to have to take the scraps for a little while. Mm -hmm and just be here and just be available. It was scary. Cause at that point I was on salary with Josh. Yeah. And you know, it was definitely like, man, I just spent like the whole first half of my twenties, like getting stability as a musician. Like I just bought a house and like, now you guys are telling me I got to kind of like start over if I want to yeah. do this. <laughs> but by that point I did, I, I knew like, that's, this is the part of it I want to be doing. Yeah. I want to be on the creative spot and I want to play with these players. And like, this is, it's different every day and it's challenging and it's exciting. And like, this is, this is what I want to do. So I, yeah. you know, I made the job, I'm going and sitting on Josh's bus and was like, I gotta quit. <laughs> and, and it's not about money and it's not that I'm leaving to go to another artist. Yeah. I want to be playing on records and yeah. And this is what it is. And I'll give you as much notice as you need. I just need you to know that I'm not staying here forever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was bummed, but took it gracefully because it, it, it was what I said it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, although he did try to offer me more money to stay, <laughs> and I, did, I was like, nah, appreciate that. It's not, that's, yeah. that's not what it is. Um, and so then I, you know, I, then I just stayed in town and, wow. and tried to, tried to hustle it. What was the first hit record that you that you played on? Well, it's it's interesting. It's hard to say up to some degree because you know this, like the way the staggered nature yeah. releases come out. Um, but the first number one song that I ever had was Maddie and Tay, Girl in the Country Song. Oh, wow. And I want to say that was like 2014, yeah. 13, 14, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but... But that song was so fast tracked. Like I remember they signed their record deal at the session when we cut that song. Wow. And Scott Borchetta, who runs that label was like on fire. He was like, this is a moment. Like this should, song should have been out two weeks ago. And that yeah. song was really fast tracked. And so if I really looked back at the calendar, I might have already have played on a couple other hits before that, that hadn't been released yet. Right. But it, it, it kind of all started to happen there around yeah. the same time. Okay. And is it like, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is an answerable question, but I'm just curious, like, you know, you're playing on sessions. Is there like a, a point where you're like, I'm like kind of one of the guys now? I don't know if that makes <laughs> sense. You know what I, I, and I, and I know that may be like uncomfortable to think about, but like, I'm always me and my friends in the, you know, that are, when we're writing songs, like, right. Like somebody like Brett Tyler, it's like, yeah. he was so much I felt like he was such a better writer than so many of the people I was writing with for like five years before he yeah, had sure. his big first, uh, you know, hit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know how that, I'm not as familiar with the, with the session world, I guess. So I, I think, uh, I mean, the analogy I'll, I'll use a lot is, you know, if you bump into someone you haven't seen in five years and they've undergone some kind of like, you know, really drastic physical transformation. Yeah. If you know, if you see him and you're like, 
oh my God, what have you been doing, man? You look you're so thin. Like you're, man, yeah, you, you look, look great. great. Like, wow, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. And, but to that person, you know, they've been watching it come off in the mirror, like a pound a day. Mm -hmm. And so two things are true. Like, yeah, objectively, you have to acknowledge that the scale number is different now. Yeah. And that same thing for me, like, you know, you win a couple of awards or you, 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 you hit, you check some boxes in your career and you have to objectively look back and go, yeah, I, I acknowledge that mm -hmm. these things have happened for me. Yeah. But you can also somehow still not feel any different than the guy who was just hoping to get on a session. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's, you know, for me, from my point of view, it's, it was all just so, so gradual, um, yeah, you like it's, the, the you know case in point ten year town right. It's like I've been, I played on my first hit song like about ten years ago. Yeah, and it's like, you know, so you have to think about it like that. It's like you know whatever, you know things that are happening for me now and success. You know, it's like this has been going on a long time. Yeah, <laughs> you <yeah>. know, <laughs> it's it's not a, you know an, an overnight success sure. for me in the. Um, uh, in that world. And then I would say even before that, number one, it was like, I had been, you know, a guitar player making a living as a guitar player for about 10 years before that. Yeah. Wow. Honestly, more. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, the, 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 to, but to answer your question, like, does it feel any different? It, and it, it really doesn't. I mean, yeah. there's, you have a few, you know, you have a few laurels to rest on, but at the end of the day, yeah, you know, it's still like, uh, I'm still just trying to do the best I can and I may play some shit today that everybody hates. Yeah. Well, does it, um, does the nature of it change when you've played guitar on a hit record? Like in this, in the way that it does, you know, again, just comparing it to the writer community, right? You get a number one, like most people say like, nah, it didn't change too much. Maybe, maybe like the perception changed, but what you're doing is the same. Yeah. I mean, and I think, the perception part is what you notice the most okay. is it's, you know, I don't approach it any different yeah. than I always have. Yeah. Now, again, objectively, I've probably learned a lot of tricks and a lot of things that make me better at it than I was 10 years ago. Sure. But the approach has always been the same. Here's something, hopefully be inspired, respond and service the song, right? Like it's as simple as that. Yeah. But to your point, the perspective of the people you're working for. I always say this, it's like, it's, to me, it's, it's a lot harder to earn respect than it is to lose respect or maybe <laughs> respect isn't the word, but like confidence. It's a lot harder to earn someone's confidence than it is to lose confidence. And my experience with that has been that like, yeah, when I was kind of the new guy, if I was fumbling around with something or, missed the mark on a song or two, people might start looking around going, man, did we get the right fucking guy in here? Like, yeah. is this is this for real? And like now, you know, you play on whatever, however many hits, and it's like, it would have to go pretty bad for me one day on a session for someone to be like, man, we messed up here. Yeah, we shouldn't have hired this guy. <laughs> you get so much grace yeah. because of the track record sure. where they're, they're definitely gonna, you know, give you more line to, to, to try stuff or fumble. Like if I mess up playing a solo or something now, like no one's going to bat an eye. They're going right. to be like, Oh, he'll play the next one. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Back then when you're trying to break in, it's, it's a little bit different. And I think for songwriters, it's true. You know, that same kind of like name recognition, the, the leaning on the track record, that's undeniable in songwriting. Like right. people will, I'm sure you've had other people on this podcast say that it's like people will judge a song before they've even heard it based on the names associated with no it. No doubt. And that's human nature. Like yeah. it, you can cry about that or you can acknowledge that that's the way of the world. It's, yeah. It's, and and you deal with it. Right. Right. And so hope maybe you get yourself in a position where you're one of those names that is cast favorably. Right. And good on you. Yeah. You life know? is good. And if you're not, there's nothing you can do about it except just keep trying to get better. Yeah. Okay. So like sitting here today, it's easy to connect the dots looking back. It mm -hmm. looks like you know, my, my perception of your journey has just been like, oh, well, it went, it just went like this the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So like, were there, uh, I'm sure there were road bumps along the way, yeah. you know, uh, hardships. Oh yeah. Uh, like, are there, I, I think it's always just encouraging for people to like, understand it's not easy. 
It's like, a, is there like, um, I don't know. Is oh, there I got any? a story. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, um, that period of time when I had quit my gig with Josh and was trying to make it on, on sessions. Yeah. Um, I was doing some sessions, but not, not enough sessions to make up the income that I had just given gotcha. up with Josh. Yeah. And at that point I was taking every in-town gig I could possibly take. Like I would play for $20 at the basement. I would play for a free bar tab because, you know, my, my thought at the time was like any excuse to go play music. Cause I'm either going to be playing at my house practicing yeah. or I can go break even like if I get 10 bucks to put gas in my car, right. I can go play there and do this and maybe meet somebody or maybe make a connection. And one of the things about studio recording is that the pay is just really delayed. It's just the nature of the beast. It's like these larger companies, whether it's a record or a publishing company or whatever, like they don't cut checks every two weeks. Like there's yeah. a big invoicing system and, and they don't pay on a lot of this stuff until things are fully delivered. And you, you know, I'd go do a demo session that was going to pay me one hundred and seventy nine fifty, and I might wait four months for that check. Yeah, you know, and I definitely spent a lot of days where it was like I'd wake up and I didn't have anything to work. I didn't have work that day, and I'd look at my bank account and be like, "Well, I don't have enough money to go anywhere <laughs> or get you know gas anything." So yeah. I'll wait and see if I get a check in the mailbox today. Wow! And if I get a check in the mailbox today and something comes through, I could go. Uh, whatever, maybe I can make it to the bank before they close and I can go get food tonight. Yeah. But if they don't, I'm just staying here and Eggs. playing guitar. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and I got in a real hairy spot where I got, like I was about to be two months behind on my mortgage and like, I was going to, I was going to get my house foreclosed on. Wow. And, um, and I called my mom and I was like, Hey, I, this is what's going on. You know, I really need like a thousand dollars to, you know, or like they're I'm tomorrow, like I'm getting, yeah, it, you know, the, it's they're going to start foreclosing. And she was like, well, I can, like, she's like, I, I can help. We can help, you know, let me, but I'm, can I come see you tomorrow? I want to like take you to lunch and like, let's talk. And yeah. And one thing that had happened in that period of time was I had been offered a handful of other road gigs when I quit Josh and I'd turned them all down because I was really, I just really felt like yeah. I needed to be doing the studio thing. And, you know, she, we had lunch and we came back to the house. Well, she, we had lunch and we went to the bank and we put a check in the <laughs> thing so I could pay on the phone and get, yeah. you know, stay in my house. And she, you know, in, in more words was like, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't just, maybe this isn't going to work out. Like maybe you should take one of those road gigs, you yeah. know, one of those, you know, the next time someone calls or do you think you could call those people back and tell them you're still interested? And I remember going and getting my, my calendar and my, my, cause that's how you kept them back then. You kept yeah. like an actual book. Yeah. And I was like showing her like all, I was like, look, mom, look, I, I know this is embarrassing because I'm, I'm, I don't have any money and I just had to borrow some money, but like, look at, look at all the sessions I've been doing and like, look at like, I did a session for Ashley Gorley. I did a, I did, yeah. I did a session for Jeffrey Steele. And like, if I could just get everyone, you know, like I'd been making money. Like if I could have had everyone from the last two months, like pay me at once, I would have had enough to pay my bills. I'm like, I'm just waiting on the money. Like I, this is, it's not that I'm just sitting here doing nothing and this is this. And she kind of like, yeah, I could tell she was like, oh, okay, okay, all right. And yeah. didn't really trust, but felt the urgency in my voice that yeah. was like, okay, he's, I'm just going to let it ride a it's, little bit longer. It's uh, it's in the pipeline. The money's yeah. in the pipeline. Literally. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and then it did. It was like a couple weeks later, like the checks just started to show up. Yeah. And, you know, I was able to pay her back and then, and- and then kind of from that moment on, it was really like, that was the moment. And then suddenly the, the checks just started to come. It was like the backlog stuff started to catch up and that's still session world to this day. Like the checks you cash this month isn't for what I did last week or two weeks ago. It's yeah. like, 
that's, you know, June paid for August. Yeah. You know, or September, if you're lucky. Right, um, right. And you you have to kind of get to that spot where you the work is consistent enough that the, there's just always kind of checks in the mail. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, luckily it was right about that time. Because that was about a year into me having quit. And right about that time, the year, 18 months in, I just started to, it just kind of started to happen. Um, and then I also picked up this one terrible account that had like the worst songs ever, but they always would pay me cash. <laughs> and they were super busy. Like they would work every day of the week. And I knew that if I didn't have a real session, I could always say yes to them and yeah. I could go and like leave with cash money. And then that started to kind of like, I was like, whew, okay. Like I don't have to, I wasn't like trapped at home just waiting on a check anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was the, definitely was that moment where, you know, my, but literally my mom was like, maybe it's not yeah, going to work. Oh, it's not, I've, I've, I do believe in you, Dewey. I just know you're going to fail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Dewey Cox thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, you know. I've had those, uh, those talks with, with, with my mom before. 100%. Uh, man. And it's, and it's hard. I, I, and, um, and, and sorry, and, try, and that's from my parents in the music business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like they know how it works. And she right. was still kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. Ugh. It's called, I, I call it, it's like, if you think of your career as like two funnels and then in between there's like, they're, they're both, they're opposite, right? So there's the skinny part of the funnel yeah. and very, at various points in your career, you get, you get stuck in there Yeah, and you know, it's going to be all right. You just kind of got to stay the course and, 100%. and try and figure it out. But but that's a testament. It's like getting, you know, whatever, street smart or whatever you want to call it. It's like, all right, here's here's this gig over here. This one pays me cash. This will get me through, you know, till the... Well, and, and to your point and to your analogy, like those things never quit happening. Like right. they look different. Like no matter what success level you've achieved and like no matter what your bank account says and yeah. no matter what trophies you have on the wall, there's still moments when you're like, man, I played on like six records for that guy and he didn't call me for this record. <laughs> mm. Like, whoa, am I, yeah. you know, or, 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 or whatever the case is, or you, you know, you turn in a, a, a song and, you know, somebody dumps on it and, you know, or, or you, or you, man, I wrote like three songs with this guy for his last record. And like, now I, I can't even get him to answer the phone. Like, what did I do? And it's like, dude. Even the like superstar songwriter, producer, musicians experience that stuff. Yeah. Like I have heard the biggest songwriters in this town be like, man, do you know what's going on with so-and-so record? I know you play on that. I just, I, I, he hasn't written with me for this whole, this whole album cycle. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, did I do something? It's like, dude, that stuff never quits. It yeah. never stops. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. I guess now you sort of like, you're, you've continued to do the, the, all the session work and everything like that. And, mm -hmm. um, what, what would you call your, your role at Spear? Are you like an executive? Like I would, begr I would yeah, I would begrudgingly <laughs> call myself an executive. You're yeah. a suit now. Yeah. I mean, my official title is, you know, VP of a and vice president of A&R yeah. at, at Spirit Music. You know, that all came from, you know, my love of songwriters and songwriting. You know, I'm not a songwriter myself. Yeah. I've, I've truly have never felt like that's my, like that's my gift. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, I, I'm so lucky to, you know, as a guitar player and a producer to get to hear great music and respond to that. And, and if I'm lucky, you know, add to it. Yeah. But the, the show up and here's a blank sheet of paper thing was just never a part of the process that I was passionate about. Yeah. But the nature of my session career, I was always so much younger than a lot of the guys for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so when we would get done with demo sessions and those guys were all going home to their family and like, you know, single 20 somethings me was like, Hey, what are you songwriters doing? And, yeah. you know, and we'd go hang out and party. And so like all of my best friends have are songwriters. And even before I was involved with, with spirit and when Frank Rogers kind of approached me with the opportunity to go over there, it just seemed like such a natural chance for me to, be closer to that part of the music that I appreciate and respect so much and yeah. partner with like friends and songwriters and peers that I love and believe in and am genuine fans of. Yeah. And, um, you know, when, 
when he, when we, the first day we ever talked about it, I was like, well, on a basic level, the idea of walking through a building every day and just seeing rooms full of songwriters that I love and being like, fuck yeah, they're cool. Hell yeah, they're cool. Yeah. Hell yeah, I love them. That's really exciting. Yeah. And so the opportunity to be a part of something like that, just as a standalone proposition was like, yeah, let's figure this out. Right. You know, be, to be inspired and to work with people that I, that I love because- Definitely played on demo sessions for songwriters. I didn't like the songs. Yeah. Like that's, I played on records for songs. I didn't like the songs. <laughs> yeah. So the idea to, to kind of put myself in a position to work more and more and c more closely with people who I was already a fan of, like yeah. that was enough to get the ball roll in there. Gotcha. And that's still really, you know, the essence of what I do there is it's still just being a champion of our writers there because I'm a genuine fan yeah. Of our writers there. Yeah. You know, there's I, a lot of really great writers there. We've got a, we've got a good crew of people. And yeah. I mean, my, my, my joke is, I mean, I think you've probably heard me say this, but it's like, look, if I'm going to sign up for another email a day, it better be somebody I think is awesome because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to just sign up to get another email a day from some songwriter who's not inspiring to me. Like it's, I gotta be like, oh yeah. New David Garcia song. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Let's go and yeah. be ready to open it because my email is already a disaster. Yeah. You know, so, um, and I also think that that's the only way you can be a genuine flag waver for somebody because you can't like, you can't impose, you know, belief upon somebody. Like you right. can't convince someone to be a true advocate and a true believer in somebody. Like that kind of passion has to come from within. You have right. to, you yourself have to hear, they have to themselves just hear it and be like, I love this. I'm a fan. Yeah. Uh, you can try to force that down people, but I just don't think it's, it's hard. I think it's really hard. Yeah. And so, so yeah, just the fact that, you know, having people in our building that I'm a genuine fan of, that I love those songs, it's like, well, that makes it all pretty easy. Yeah. Because then it's easy to find the opportunities for me to connect the dots or, help them with something or play on something or yeah. pass something off to someone. It's so easy and it's so organic because I think it's great. Right. And it is like ultimately, you know, the same skill in the studio is the same skill as a publisher, right? It's like in service of the song and trying to get thousand percent the right, either the right part or to the right person, to the right producer. You know, it's, it's a similar, it's in your, uh, something I think about a lot. It's like in your cone of genius, right? This is an area <laughs> sure. that, you play well in, and that's how I try to think about my career always is like, yeah. I am, I know a little bit about this part. So what are, what parts are adjacent to what I'm doing that I can expand in? And I think that, yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, what advice would you tell to somebody that has just moved here or maybe has been here for a while that wants to get into either, you know, being a session player or being a producer or something like that? Man, I, I kind of give everybody the same advice when you get here. Like if you if you want to be a creative in Nashville, like the best thing you can do is find places where music is happening that you would like to be a part of yeah. and just go there. Mm. Just be present because I can tell you pretty much 0, 0.0 times in my career did somebody just hear me play guitar on a stage and come up to me and go, Hey, you're awesome. Can I give you all these work and all these opportunities? <laughs> yeah. But what happened so, more times than I can count is somebody who had never heard me play a note that I had been around more than a handful of times had just said, Hey man, do you want to do this thing? I can't, yeah, I got yeah. Because, you know, the familiarity breeds trust to mm -hmm. an extent. And I just think the the more you can show up and be a consistent person in this business, yeah. people are going to trust that and put stock in that and and call upon you for that more than they're going to call upon you for just the skill set. Mm. And I even say this about myself too, as a studio musician or as a producer or anything, like people don't hire me because they think I'm the best guitar player that's ever lived or that lives in Nashville even or whatever. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, they hire me because I have become somehow to them a person that they see value in as a collaborator. Yeah. And 
that's why they want me there. And I think you, that value you create by being a consistent human being mm -hmm. and just being there and being a part of it all. And so, you know, like I said, I got so many in my early days, I had so many opportunities given to me or that I found because I was just hanging at songwriters rounds yeah. and meeting friends and, and, you know, Sometimes I spent the last $7 in my bank account to buy me and this guy a Bud Light. Right. But, you know, at the end of the day, those moments were some of the times that got me huge opportunities down the road. You know, it wasn't that, you know, I played some badass gig at Third and Lindsley and then all of a sudden everybody in town wanted to hire me. Like, right. It, it just, it wasn't that way. It's, it's time and it's consistency. And so back to your original question, it's like, I just say like, Find places where people are making the kind of music that you want to be a part, that that's a scene that you feel like you make sense in. And like, that's the, you know, find people who are doing what you want to be doing and find, place yourself around them, you yeah. know, and just be cool. Like it, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's just part of it just can't be overstated. I know it, it is crazy. Like, um, you know, we had Courtney Allen um, on here and, and, we were just talking about like, yeah, just like being present, like being a good hang and like not asking anybody for anything. Right. So yeah. like, uh, and by the way, that's hard to do. It, it is hard to it's do. It's hard to not ask for something when you are just dying for that opportunity. Yeah. When you're desperate for a chance, when you're desperate to pay a bill, mm -hmm. it is hard to just be cool yeah. and act like you're, one of the people, um, the only, you know, the only thing I could tell somebody, you know, f for comfort in that thing is that like all the rest of those people, if they aren't feeling the exact same way that you are now, yeah. they have at some point. Right. So, yeah. you know, you just know that about the situation. Yeah. I, th I think that's how you develop all this kindred spirit. Like even now, like see a young person on their way, you know, yeah. a young buck. And I'm like, I just, I don't know. I like something about this person. I like, I'm trying to help. I'm trying to find ways to help. And, and, percent. and I think that that just, cause people did that for me. Right. hundred so, percent. Um, that's just kind of how, that's what the, the community of Nashville, that's why it's so s special. And I'm sure there are other communities, you know, elsewhere in the musical space that are like that. But I've, you know, when I started playing in Texas, which I think, I don't know if we met, but I think that's the first time you saw me play. Yeah, opening for Granger Smith. Yeah. It was like, you know, I, I think we, we talked about that. It was probably six years later. Yeah. You know, but when that, we actually met and hung. Yeah, yeah. But like that, or, or when you brought up that story to me, yeah. um, and like, you know, that resonated with me when you said that, I was like, oh yeah, that's crazy. Like you just never know when you're planting a little seed that years later will grow into something. Um, yeah. Because case in point, like, you know, I don't remember, honestly, either if we, we might have said something to each other in passing at that thing. Yeah. But I remember the show and thinking, this guy's good, cool, good band, blah, blah. And it ended there. Right. But then reconnecting with you years later, like, I still approach you from that way of like, oh yeah, it's cool, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good dude. He was good. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, good to see you again. Yeah. And I think that stuff goes way further than, than people realize. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's hard to, when you're on year one of, of your climb, it's just hard <laughs> to have the perspective of like that, you know, that thing or whatever. So Dude, it's, yeah, it's, it's all so hard yeah. and we all make mistakes. I mean, that's the other thing too. I mean, I look back at things I did or <laughs> oh things God. I said to people, I just cringe, Yeah, but it's unavoidable and everybody did it and everybody yeah. does it. And you, yeah. You know, you, you learn from it. 100%. It hurts and you grow and that's it, man. That's, that's it. I, I, that, I, um, the other story I've told a lot of times is the very first time I did like a big, like a big, long triple demo session, which if people don't realize here in town, we, we kind of cut sessions from 10 to one, two to five, and then six to nine are the, the, the standard session yeah. times. And so I did a, I did a triple 10, two and six. And it was demos, which means we cut 15 songs that day. And I remember we got to the lunch break and I was playing a solo. So I was the last guy in the room and I walked out 
uh, to the control room after I played the solo and everybody was gone. The songwriter was gone. The band was gone. Everybody, and I was like, I asked the second engineer guy, I go, uh, where'd everybody go? And he's like, I think they all went to lunch. And I was like, oh, cool. And I realized I didn't have anybody's phone number because I was the new guy. Yeah. So I was like, oh, uh, I guess I'll just go like walk to lunch by myself. So I went and had lunch somewhere. I came back, do the two o'clock, five o'clock, the exact same thing happens. I mean, they're playing a solo. I come out, everyone's gone. They all walked to dinner somewhere, went to dinner somewhere. I had, you know, they get back at six and we got done at like nine and everybody leaves is what it was. Yeah. I remember like telling my dad about it the next day. And I was like, yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal. Like, here's how it went. And yeah. my dad was like, yeah, you know, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun for a little while. <laughs> but, but, he, but he said, and I remember them saying this, he goes, but you know, one day you're going to just look up in there and that room's going to be all your buddies and then it's going to be fun. Yeah. And man, was he right? Because, mm. and you talked, you referenced Brett Tyler earlier, but like, and you know a lot of the circle I run in and, and my friends, but it was like, yeah, it was it was cool in the moments when I got called to go play on a big songwriter's, you know, demo session or a big artist's record. Like that stuff was cool. But yeah. like what I have enjoyed infinitely more are the times when like you're kind of graduating class, like your homies, when you look around the room and the artist is somebody that you have a, 10 year history with and yeah. you came up with, you know, like I bought Maren Morris her first beer in Nashville. Like she's a homie. Yeah. And, and Ryan, when you look up and it's songs written by your friends and the artist is your buddy and all the guy in the, you came up in the, like the guy playing bass on this session, me and you used to do those terrible showcases at 12th and Porter together. And like that to me has been the moments when it's the most fun. Yeah. The, the times when you get a call from some superstar you'd never met, it's like, that's kind of cool, man. Kind of wild. I got a call from, man, they, I'm going to go play on this record. Wow, that's yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah. But that's more of like novelty fun. Like the real fun is showing up and it's your buddies. It's the people that you yeah. were in the trenches with for years and years. And you now see everybody is up there. It's like, what's cool climbing Mount Everest? You know what's cooler? Getting to the top of Mount Everest with 10 of your buddies. Yep. It's the best, man. That's the best part. It's the best. And that's how you kind of, we talk about it a lot, but it's like, that's when you really start to feel there's no, there's no jealousy or anything like that. You're just like, this is so hard and I'm so happy that I'm on this journey with these people, you know? Dude, you can all win. It's, it's a marathon. Yeah. That really is it. And the bottom line is like, yeah, does somebody quote unquote win the marathon? Sure. Yeah. But 99% of the people running that, you know, the win is finishing. They're stoked to finish. And then to do that and to share that moment. Yeah. And, and the reality is it's all still rare air. Like if you look at the percentage of whatever, just the population of America, and then look at the percentage of that population that's finished a marathon, yeah. it's probably pretty small <laughs> yeah, no comparatively. Mm -hmm. And same thing, like to experience, you know, some of that rarefied air, like that's cool to do on your own. It's even cooler when you do it with, you know, homies. Yeah, dude, it's the best. Yeah. Um, well, Derek Wells. Thank you so much for oh, being here, man. Glad to do it. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's the pod. See you later. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Keep rating. Keep reviewing. Keep subscribing. We love you. Talk to you soon. Bye.